Good morning. It is so good to have each and every one of you here with us this morning as we continue in our study in 1 Kings. Today we'll be starting our study in 1 Kings chapter 15, verse number 1. So if you've got your Bible handy, just pick up your Bible and turn to 1 Kings 15, verse 1. And let's uh, begin our study with a word of prayer. Father, we praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. And the honor that you've given us, Lord, of being able to open your word together, to discuss it freely without without hesitation and without fear that we, were, we, we would be stopped or arrested or something of that nature. Lord, we know that this right is a privilege that, that comes from you. It's a blessing, one of our greatest blessings, Lord. Lord, we know that all healing comes from you and that you are able to do all things. And Lord, we lift up those that we love who are in prayer by name even now. Lord, we ask that you would provide them with the healing that they need. Lord, we know that you say in your word that we sometimes have not because we ask. Them. Lord, we ask for that healing freely. But Lord, we always ask that your will be done in each and every case. Lord, we pray for our, our community, our state, our nation, and even our world. Lord, we ask that the leaders that are in our nation that, you would convict them of their sins, Lord, and show them the truth. Lord, show them the right ways that they should go according to your word and the, and the things that you say in your word. Lord, help each one of them to learn to live by faith in you and trust in your ways. Lord, we ask that you would guide us now as we open your word together. Guide our hearts. Help us to understand these things, and especially, Lord, help us to know how to apply these timeless truths in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I want to start out by looking at a map with you this morning. 922 B.C., the ten northern tribes of Israel, you see that area in green here on your map, okay, the 10 northern tribes of Israel under the leadership of, of a man named Jeroboam rebelled against King Rehoboam, who was originally the king of Israel. And as Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem after that rebellion, the, the prophet Ahijah had told Jeroboam that God would make his kingdom great like King David's if only Jeroboam would follow God faithfully. But King Jeroboam ordered instead that two calves be made, built out of gold, and two altars, one made for each one of those. He ordered that those be that the that the calves and the two, and the altar be placed one in Bethel, which is right here at the southern part of Israel, okay, and the other be placed at Dan, way up here in the very northern part of Israel. And by doing this, Jeroboam chose from the very beginning of his reign that he was going to bring his nation to worship false gods, idols. And King, King Jeroboam also allowed non-Levites to serve as priests to these idols and to change the date of one of the fall feasts from what God had commanded in his written law, which is Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So we come down to what happens immediately after that. As you see, uh, the southern kingdom of Judah, the one tribe of Judah, is down here in this area that's in purple. We see its capital city in Jerusalem. And we see that the capital city of the ten northern tribes was originally Shechem. See the star here beside Shechem. Okay, and now let's let's go on to the scriptures, starting in chapter 15, verse number 1. 
In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maaka, the granddaughter of Abishalom, and he walked, and he, being Abijam, walked in all the sins of his father, who is Rehoboam, which he had done before him, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For about the 18th year, in, in about the 18th year of Jeroboam's reign as king over the ten northern tribes of Israel, Rehoboam died, and his son Abijam became king over Judah. Unfortunately for all the nation of Judah, Abijam continued the idolatrous practices for all of the sins of his father and of King Solomon, his grandfather, before him. 1 Kings 11 talks about how even Solomon, the son of David, had turned away from God to, to worshiping idols also. That's in 1 Kings chapter 11. Abijam's heart, it says here, was not loyal to the Lord his God. The Lord is God's covenant name. You see it's all written all in caps there in verse number three. And his covenant name is Yahweh. Okay. Fortunately for the rest of Judah, the Lord only allowed Abijam to reign three years as king before he too died. Now it's come down to verses 4 and 5. Only because David did was right, what was right in the eyes of the Lord, did God allow the lineage of David to continue in Judah and thereby fulfill the Lord's promise. In 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16, to establish an eternal kingdom through David's offspring, the Messiah, Christ. Now let's come down to verses 6 through 7. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of, the, of his life. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam, Abijam, Abijam and all that he did, are, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between, between Abijam and Jeroboam, just like there had been war between Jeroboam and his father Rehoboam. Now, I want to say that note the note here about the book of Chronicles have written inf more information on the kings of Judah and also of Israel. And we'll be looking at some of those in this lesson this morning. There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of Abijam's life. In 2 Chronicles 13, 2 through 20, we read in starting in verse 3, Abijah set the battle to order in order with an army of valiant warriors. Or look at the numbers of men. 400,000 choice men for Judah, okay, because this is Abijah. Jeroboam from Israel also drew up in battle formation against him with 800,000 choice men, mighty men of valor. Then Abijam stood in Mount Zamarim, Zamarim, which is in the mountains of Ephraim, and said, Hear me, Jeroboam, and all Israel. Should you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the dominion over Israel to David forever, to him and his sons, by a covenant of salt? Now let's come down to verse 8. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord, which is in the hand of the sons of David, and you are a great multitude 
with you are, are the gold calves which Jeroboam made for you as gods? Have you not cast out the priests of the Lord, the sons of Aaron and the Levites, and made for yourselves priests like the peoples of other lands, so that whoever comes to consecrate himself with a young bull and seven rams may be a priest of things that are not gods? Come down to verse 10. But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. And the priests who minister to the Lord are the sons of Aaron, and the Levites attend to their duties. Now come down to verse 12. Now look, God himself is with us as our head, and his priests will sounding trumpets to sound the alarm against you. O children of Israel, do not fight against the Lord. God of your fathers, for you shall not prosper. But Jeroboam caused an ambush to go out, to go around behind them so that they were in front of Judah and the ambush was behind them. Let's come down to verse 14. When Judah looked around, to their surprise, the battle line was at both front and rear. And they cried out to the Lord. And the priests sounded the trumpets. Then the men of Judah gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it happened that God struck Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. Now, verse 17, then Abijah and his people struck them with a great slaughter. 500,000 choice men of Israel fell slain. Thus, the children of Israel were subdued at that time, and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied on the Lord God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued Jeroboam and took cities from him, Bethel. In its villages, Yeshanah, Yeshanah, and its villages, and Ephraim and its villages. So Jeroboam did not recover strength again in the days of Abijah, and the Lord struck him, and he died. Now let's go back to First Kings 15, starting in verse 9, where we read, in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, which would have been 910 B.C., Asa became king over Judah, and he reigned 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Maacah, and the granddaughter of Abishalom. Now let's come down to verses 11 through 13. Esau did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. So Esau went back to worshiping the Lord, and he banished the perverted persons from the land and removed all the idols that his, fathers, that his father had made. Also, he removed Maaka, his grandmother, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook Kidron. Come down and look at verse 14. I'm sorry. First, let's go down and let's, let's talk about these verses that we just looked at. Let me go back to those just a second. Let's look at those. Son. In verse 11, we see the Hebrew word translated right. It can also mean just or upright and has as its root meaning the idea of straightness. The comment also contrasted Esau's faithfulness to God to the unfaithfulness of his father Abijam and his father Rehoboam and his father Solomon. 
toward the end of his life. Esau was determined to lay hold of the promise of God that God had made to David and stop Judah's downward spiral. Now let's look at verse 12. Esau banished the perverted persons from the land, as is translated in the New King James. That is translated in the Christian Standard Bible, Esau banished the male cult prostitutes of the land. Now let me tell you why that Christian Standard Bible translates it that way. Many of the Canaanite peoples practice sexual rites as a part of their pagan worship. Deuteronomy 23.17 told the people of Israel, the Lord had warned them through Moses before they came into their promised land to not do these things that the Canaanites did. But when we get to the book of Judges in the early days of Israel, Judges chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, and chapter 3, verse 7, once God's people settled in the land, they began to worship these false gods, such as Baal and Asherah, and to adopt their worship their pagan worship practice. In verse 12, Esau removed all the idols that his fathers had made that were in Judah. 1 Kings 11, 7 records how both Solomon and Rehoboam were guilty of actually making these idols and participating in the worship of those idols. All right? So let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 5, I mean chapter 15, verse 16, where it goes ahead and gives us some more information on what Asa did. And he removed Maacah, the mother of Asa, the, the king, from being queen mother because she had cut, she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image, then crushed it and burned it by the brook Kidron. Now, the brook Kidron is just east of the temple in Jerusalem that was built by Solomon. Okay. There's a valley right that runs right east of the temple, right next to Mount Moriah or Mount Zion, which is the place where the temple is located. Okay. Asherah was a Canaanite goddess of fertility. He, she was the cohort of Baal. The Hebrew word translated obscene image comes from a, ro a root that means to shudder and emphasizes the awful nature of the idol made by Asa's grandmother. Idols of Asherah have been found by archaeologists all over Israel. They are usually the images of a naked woman carved into the trunk of a tree. As Asa cut down his grandmother's obscene image, okay, probably did this publicly so everybody could see that he was doing it. This was something that his grandmother had put up. He cut it down, and he crushed it, and he burned it right beside the brook Kedron. Esau likely called the people of Judah to publicly witness this action by him. Now let's come back to Second Chronicles, this time in chapter 14, starting in verse 2. It says that Esau did what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he removed the altars of the foreign gods and the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandment. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah and the kingdom was quiet under him. The Hebrew term 
translated high places here, denotes an elevated site that were, were found, these elevated sites were found throughout Israel, which held the altars for the worship of the Canaanite idols like Baal and Asherah. The law of Moses in Deuteronomy 12, 2 through 7, told the people that when they entered their promised land, they were not to offer sacrifices to any of Canaan's idols, but they were to offer sacrifices only in the place that the Lord chose. And this place was to be the location of the either the tabernacle that God had showed them how to make, or the temple, which was a a stronger structure that was modeled after the tabernacle. These were the acceptable places for God to be worshipped, for the Lord God to be worshipped, and for them to offer sacrifices to the Lord God. Now let's come down to verse 14 in our text. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. That's the New King James translation. The Hebrew word heart was loyal that you see there in that verse can be translated wholeheartedly as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible. The word is related to the Hebrew word shalom, denoting a, a wholeness or completeness of life and attitude. Asa could not solve every spiritual issue in Judah, but he could set a strong example and lead his people toward God and God's written word. The same is true of our leaders today. That's the reason I prayed the prayer that I did at the start of our study, is that God would convict the hearts of our leaders such that they would be set an example for all the people in their representative areas to follow the Lord God, the one true living God, Yahweh, and His Son, Jesus, the Messiah or the Christ. If they did, our country would be better and better off. Verse 15, Asa also brought into the house of the Lord the things which the Lord, which his father had dedicated, and the things which he himself had dedicated. In other words, they, they replaced some of the things that were old and worn out in the temple, kept it looking good, and, and, and kept everything in, in good working order. That's what that means. Now, some interpreters believe the word his father is not Abijam, but refers all the way back to Solomon who had built the temple. I, I tend to think that way too, that, that the temple's getting pretty old now, and, it's, and the things that are getting used a lot are getting worn out. The Hebrew word translated dedicated, the Hebrew word translated dedicated in the New King James can also be translated consecrated, as it is in the Christian Standard Bible. And it comes from a root word that means set apart or separate or holy. These things that were made and put in the temple were set apart to God. They were designated as holy, belonging only to God and to be used only in the worship of the Lord God. Asa designed, desired to set these gifts apart for God's service, to be considered holy to him. Asa brought silver and gold utensils to the Lord's temple, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible. The king's actions again testified to his determination to follow the Lord, Yahweh. Hebrews 13, 17 tells us that God expects his leaders, the people who know him through his son, Jesus Christ, to wholeheartedly 
be a testimony to other people. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, or that for that would be unprofitable for you. In 2 Chronicles 14.1 in the Old Testament, Asa and Judah enjoyed peace for the first for Asa's first 10 years as king. And this was a blessing from God to Asa and the people of Judah for turning back in worship to him. Okay. Now let's come down to 2 Chronicles 15, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read a, a long set of texts here in 2 Chronicles so you can pick up and understand this situation better. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed. Okay, now this is Azariah is a prophet of God. Okay, so the Spirit of God came on him, and he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel has been without the true God without a teaching priest, and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. Now let's come down to verses 5 through 6. And in those days there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was, was on all the inhabitants of the lands. So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. Now let's come down to verse 8. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Obed the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable items from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which had been taken in the mountains of Ephraim, and they restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin, and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, for they came over to him in great numbers from Israel when they saw that the Lord, Afe, his God, was with him. So they gathered together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the 15th year of the reign of Asa. Now let's come down to 2 Chronicles 15, 12. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their, their soul. Now come to 14. They took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice and shouting, and trumpets, and ram's horns. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart, and sought him with all their soul. And he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all around. Now we're going to go to Second Chronicles 14. Look at verses 6 and 7. And Asa built fortified cities in Judah, for the land had rest. He had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. Therefore, he said to Judah, let us build these cities and make walls around them and towers and gates and bars while the land is yet before us because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. Now let's come down to Second Chronicles 14.8. And Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah who carried shields and spears, and from Benjamin, 280,000 men who carried shields and drew, and drew bows. 
All these were mighty men of valor. Then Zeroth, the Ethiopian, came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. And he came to Marishah. And as Esau went out to, against him, they set the troops in battle array in the valley of Zarephath and Marishah. Now let's, let's come down to 2 Chronicles 14, starting in verse 11. And as Esau cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against the mult this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. Now come down to verse 12. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before us, Esau and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Esau and the people were with him, pursued them to Gerar. So the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army, and they carried away much spoil. Then they defeated all the cities around Gerar. Okay, so they won a great victory. The point that we can see here is that they were highly outnumbered. They even had better weapons with all of their chariots. But yet the people of Israel, led by their leader, Asa, their king, they lifted up their hearts to the Lord and they said, we're placing our trust in you and we're going to battle in this situation following your leadership. And God was faithful to help them. And, they, and God gave them a miraculous victory. So let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 16. Now, there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, throughout their reigns. Okay? So things began to change. Now Asa is, is encountering, he had peace the first 10 years of his reign, but now he's, he's being attacked on, on two sides, first from the south by Ethiopia, and now from the north by Israel, the 10 northern tribes of Israel. <coughs> Baasha had become king of Israel during Asa's third year. And Baasha is going to reign 24 years over Judah. I mean, over Israel, the northern 10 northern tribes. Wars occurred between these two king, kings regularly over that entire time, those 24 years. Baasha was an evil king, and he did not follow the Lord, as we see written in 1 Kings 15.34. Now let's come down to verse 17. And Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Pramah, that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Ramah was an important city inside the tribal territory of Benjamin, which is just north of Judah. About five miles, it's only five miles north of the capital city of Judah, Jerusalem, near Israel's southern border. Ramah was strategically located on an east-west road between the west coast of Judah and the Jordan Valley. This road intersected a major road running north and south between Ejon, north, way north of Lake Kinnereth in Israel, and south all the way to Jerusalem, Hebron, and on to Beersheba. Ramah was also the hometown and place of burial of the prophet Samuel. In 1 Samuel 1, 
we see that mentioned and we also see it mentioned again in chapter 7 and chapter 25 in first samuel the king of judah would not allow the king of israel to block his nation's access to trade routes and resources in this way okay so what this was is the king of israel was going to was going to block their access to the trade routes it, judah's okay block their access and and the king of judah asa couldn't allow this to happen such that he would not be able to go out or come in on either side of his nation. So let's come down to verse 18. Then Asa took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Treminon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus. Then Asa took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the house of the Lord, now that's the temple, and the treasuries of the king's house, and delivered them into the hand of his servants. The Hebrew word translated his servants here denotes Asa's most trusted government officials. King Asa dispatched his servants to Damascus in Aram, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible, which is what we call modern-day Syria. And this is how it's translated in the, the New King James Version Bible. So I'm going to use that as our reference, okay, for the rest of the way. You see Syria right here in verse 18. His servants brought the silver and gold to a man named Ben-Hadad. Okay, now, Ben means son of. So his name is son of Hadad, the king of Israel of Syria. Ben-Hadad was a strong leader in Syria. We know this from other historical references. We come down to verse 19, and we see that King Asa... Asa used the silver and gold to remind ben hadad of an old treaty between his father and asa's father now asa was there hereby asking ben hadad to renew that older treaty with his father and to break his current treaty with baasha king of israel the Hebrew word for treaty that's used here in verse 19 can also be translated covenant. Asa needed Ben-Hadad's help, and he called his attention to what his servants had brought. See, I have brought you a present of silver and gold. The word translated present or gift in the Christian Standard Bible can also be translated bribe as it is in proverbs 17 23 and micah 3 11. that sense is clear from what a saw is asking ben hadad to do the silver and the gold were not really a gift or a present although he may have really used that word to ben hadad it was really a bribe Asa urged Ben-Hadad to go and break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So Asa shows how this was a strategic plan that he had to go against Baasha, king of Israel. Israel set on a map right between right between Syria and the northern border of Israel okay and if and Asa knew that if Ben Hadad would attack Israel on the north side then 
Baasha would have to withdraw his troops from the south side who were threatening to fortify those crossroad cities on those two highways, okay? And, and that, would allow, that would allow Asa to bring his armies in, okay? Now, we, we look, if we look back at verse 14 in our text, it tells us that Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. But in this case, he chose to trust in Ben-Hadad to save him rather than trusting the Lord to save him. Go to Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7. We read, At that time, Hanani, the seer. Now, seer, we see in Brown Driver Briggs, the Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew lexicon states that the Hebrew word that's used here for seer was an archaic word for someone who was known to have prophetic visions. So this was a word that was used for prophets way back in the old days. Okay. So this, this Han and I was probably a very traditional older gentleman, okay? He was a prophet, but people called him Han and I the seer since he was so old. And he came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Now let's drop on down to verse 9, and, 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 and Hanani goes on. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. foolishly. Therefore from now on you shall have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison. For he was enraged at him because of this. And they saw oppress some of the people at that time. As believers in God, we must guard our hearts when we face difficulties in life. Sometimes Sometimes human means of solving an issue may fall outside of God's plan. God calls us to always trust in his guidance and his will for our actions. Therefore, whenever we face difficult situations, we should pray to our Lord Jesus at once, without hesitation. And only proceed when we are convinced our course of action is what God wants us to do in that moment. Now let's come down to chapter 15 in our text in 1 Kings, verse 20. So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa, Asa, King Asa, and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. He attacked Ejon, Dan, Abel Beth Maaka, and all of Kinneroth, and the land of Naphtali. Now it happened when Baasha heard it that he stopped building Ramah and remained in Tizra. Or Tirza. I'm sorry, I pronounced that wrong. Now let's go to our map. Let's look at it for just a second. Okay. Ejon is right up here at the top of the map. See this? Right there. That dot right there at the top of the map is Ejon. Okay. That's at the very northernmost part of Israel. All right. Dan is just a few miles south and east of Ejon. Okay. Abel. Beth Makkah is almost directly south of Ejon. So you see these three cities together. Uh, the king of Syria attacked those three cities. And then he went on and brought his armies 
after he got past those three cities and he moved on down this major highway, which is the one that goes all the way south to Jerusalem and all the way down to Be Beersheba and on to Egypt. Okay, this is the road, one of the roads that that Israel's king Baasha was trying to take away from Judah by building these fortified areas right here in southern. Here's Ramah right here. He's fortifying that. He's fortifying Geba and And this would, and so he's thereby gaining control of this road. And then here's the east west road that comes east and west across feeding Judah with the trade routes that are going east and west. Okay, they, they cross right there. So the king of Israel, Baasha, is trying to fortify those. And now Esau, the king of Judah, has gotten. The king of Syria to attack these northern regions, and it says he attacks all the way down to Kinneroth, which is the area all the way around the Sea of Galilee, right here in the northern part of Israel, and and he go and and all the way to Naphtali. Now Naphtali is all of this region right here, next to the Sea of Galilee, on this side of the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so. The king of Syria came in and he took generally all this region, including the Sea of Galilee and everything north of it, away from Israel. So he cut this road off from the north even to Israel. Israel then had to pull their troops out of the, out of the south here and bring them up to the north to stop the advance of the Syrian army. And it, it caused the king of Israel, Baasha, to respond withdraw himself to his capital city in Tizra. Tirza. I'm sorry, Tirza. Keep mispronouncing that. That is now his capital. It used to be at Shechem. He moved it to Tizra. Tirza. Okay. All right. So Ben Hadad heeded King Asa. And he accepted Esau's gifts, and he sent his captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. And he thereby threw off his treaty with, with Israel in favor of this old treaty, the treaty that was renewed with Judah. Syria attacked these cities, the city of Dan, the city of Ejon, Kinneroth, by the way, Kinneroth is another spelling for Kinnereth and for Kinneret. Okay. These are Old Testament names for the Sea of Galilee. So when it says the region of Kinnereth, there's a city named Kinnereth that's right here on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. But what, it, what this is telling us in this text is that he attacked this whole area including Naphtali, which is over here on the western side of this main highway that he's gained, trying to gain control of, where he did gain control of, not kind of, he, he certainly did. And so uh, Esau's strategic purpose was successful. Let's come down to verse 22. Then King Esau made a proclamation throughout the land of Judah. None was exempted. And they took away the stones and the timber of Ramah, which the king of Israel had put there in, in his fortifications, which Baasha had used for, the, for building. And with them, King Asa built Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah, which was north. Okay. So if we go back to our map, king of Judah, Esau, fortified Geba. Geba is right here next to Ramah. So he fortifies both of those cities, and he put another fortress 
up here at Mizpah, which is just south of Bethel, where the king of Israel has the the idol and the main worship center there at Bethel. Okay, so he's cutting off access to this highway going south through Judah, cutting off access to Israel. And he made a proclamation. And, and he called out to the people of Israel, his advances in Baasha's advances in the, into the tribal territory of Benjamin. Esau's people came and they, Esau's people came and they took away the stones and the timber at Ramah and they built a, a they removed Baasha's barricade and he opened, they opened the important highways going north and south and east and west. Baasha established Tisra, Tirza as his capital. Uh, King Asab built Geba and Mizpah. Uh, Geba lay north of Ramah and it was assigned as a part of Benjamin's tribal territory in the days of Joshua and became one of the 48 Levitical cities of Jerusalem. Mizpah lay just to the north of Geba. God's people crowned Saul, who was a Benjamite, as king of Israel at Mizpah in 1 Samuel chapter 10. By fortifying Geba and Mizpah, both north of Ramah, King Asa was protecting his interests, restraining Baasha from attacking them again. King Asa here chose to trust his own strategy rather than God's perfect protection. In 2 Chronicles 6.12, we read, And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. Yet King Asa received a generally favorable judgment of his reign by the writer of 1 Kings. He had stopped Judah's downward spiral into sin. What we learn from this is, no matter how good a life we've lived, we sin against God. God requires that we confess that sin to him and that we repent of that sin, which means to, a sincere desire to turn away from that personal sin. This is required by God for our forgiveness by him and resumption of his blessings in our lives. Now let's come down to 1 Kings 15, 23 through 24. And the rest of all the acts of Esau, all his might and all that he did, and the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? But in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. Excuse me. So Esau rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. Then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. Esau died in 873 B.C. and His son Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah for 25 years between 873 and 848 B.C. You see those dates right there? If you want to write those down, maybe in your margin of your Bible or something, that Je Jehoshaphat reigned from 873 to 848 BC. So now let's come down to 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 3 through 6. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments, and not according to the acts of Israel. Now therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat, and he had riches and honor in abundance, 
and his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he removed the high places. See that? He removed the high places from Judah. Okay. And the wooden images from Judah. These wooden images are images of the Asherah, which were usually carved in the trunks of trees. They're obscene images. Okay. We saw earlier in the passage. Now, if we come down to verse 25 in chapter 15 of 1 Kings. Now, Nadab, son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. So, this is, we're back looking at Israel now, the ten northern tribes. Okay, They've got a new king in the second year of Asa named, named Nabab. Nadab, and he reigned over Israel two years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the way of his father, and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin. Come down to 27 and 28, 27 through 29. Then Baasha, son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, and Baasha, this is how Baasha became king. Baasha killed him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistine, while Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. And Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. And it was so that he became king that he killed all the house of Jeroboam. Killed every last one of Jeroboam's descendants so that they could not claim the throne. Then he killed, killed the current king. And so as we as we come on down, verse 33. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Baasha the son of Ahijah became king over Israel in Tizrah, Tirzah, and reigned 24 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin. So this tells how Baasha, who was the one who was fighting against Judah, and, and, and the king of Judah, Asa, went and got help from Syria. This is how Baasha came to be king, by assassination. Okay. Now let's come down to 1 Kings 16, starting in verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, Inasmuch as I lifted you out of the dust and made you ruler over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel sin to provoke me to anger with their sins. Surely I will take away the, pro the posterity of Baasha and the posterity of his house, and I will Make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Baasha and dies in the city. And the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the fields. Verse 8. In the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah, the son of Baasha, became king over Israel and reigned two years in Tirzah. Now, his servant Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Tizrah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arzah, steward of the house of Tizrah. And Zimri went in and struck him and killed him in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah. 
and reigned in his place. Then it came to pass when he began to reign as soon as he was seated on his throne that he killed all of the household of Baasha. He did not leave him one male, neither of his relatives nor of his friends. Now let's come down to 1 Kings 16, 15. And in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri had reigned in Tizra seven days. Only seven days. And the people were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. Now the people who were encamped heard it said, Zimri has conspired and also has killed the king. So all Israel made Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel, that day in the camp. Verse 17, Then Omri and all Israel with him went up from Gibbethon, and they besieged Tirzah. It happened when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he went into the citadel of the king's house, and burned the king's house down upon himself with fire and died. Let's move on down to verse 21. Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginoth, and made him king, and half followed Omri. The people who followed Omri prevailed over the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ginoth. So Tib Tibni died in Omri reign. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king over Israel and reigned 12 years. Six years he reigned in Terzah. Okay. Down to verse 24. And he brought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver. Okay, now there was a hill called Samaria that was in this region of Israel called Shemer. Okay, and he bought this, he bought this hill for two talents of silver. Then he built on the hill and called the name of the city which he built Samaria after the name of Shemer owner of the hill. Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all those who were before him. We come down to verse 28. So Omri rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. So now Samaria is the new capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Then Ahab, his son, reigned in his palace. Now this begins a strategic section of the book of Kings. It contains over one-third of the total narratives of the books in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. <coughs> Coming of the dynasty of Omri to the kingship of Israel brought with it the introduction of Baal worship with official sanction by the king of Israel. We see that in 2 Kings chapter 16. Through intermarriage with the house of Omri, Baal worship even penetrated into Judah and corrupted the line of David. Second Kings chapter 8. This would initiate a gigantic struggle between Baalism that was officially eradicated in both Israel and Judah in Second Kings chapter 19. This guy Omre ruled 12 years between 885 and 874 B.C. He died, and he was succeeded by his son Ahab.
Let's close in prayer. Father, we praise your holy name. Lord, we see from this passage powerfully that you move in the events of the world, that you are in control of all things that go on everywhere in this world, Lord. You are in control according to your perfect plan and your eternal plan from beginning to end. Father, we praise you. We ask that you would forgive us of the times that we have made our own way and our own plans. Lord, forgive us for how we've created situations that were unsuccessful in situations where you would wanting to give us great success and victory. Lord, we know that these things are our fault and not yours. That, Lord, you take care of your own. Lord, we ask that you would guide us, move back to you, to repent, to turn away from our sinfulness, and to walk with you. Lord, we confess these sins of our own to you, and we repent of those as well. And we ask that we could walk with you under your guidance and according to your will for the rest of our lives. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Be eager to see all of you back here with us uh, next week, uh, same time, same place. See you then.